we watch TV and you just see people who are competing in things. And so many people are like, I have to be perfect at something before I even want to start it. You can start with something, but it does not have to be this like huge, big thing in your brain. Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smart Ass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Atsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. I am your host, Tracy Otsuka, thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 206 of ADHD for Smart Ass Women. I hope you'll subscribe to this podcast and our newsletter over at tracyoutsuka.com. If you're a regular listener, you likely know about my signature program, Your ADHD Brain is A-OK. We call it A-OK for short. This is the six-week program that I built off of my patented cartography system to help ADHD women figure out what they should do with their life. We know that ADHD is completely misnamed, right? We don't have a deficit of attention. We have a surplus of attention. We're interested in so much, which often means that we struggle with trying to figure out which of the many interests that we do have is actually the one that we should pursue. With AOK, we start from the inside out and figure out who you really are, what's important to you, what you value, what your strengths, passions, superpowers, and purpose are, and then you're going to build your life around that. I mean, who cares where you fit in, right? You're not meant to fit in. You are meant to stand out, and I'm going to show you how to do that. So AOK includes live office hours with me, a community, the AOK system, worksheets. You'll create your own AOK intelligence report. I promise you it's a lot of fun. So we're going to start on Tuesday, January 24th. We'll have our first office hours on Wednesday, the 25th, and every Wednesday after that for the next six weeks. What a great way to finally discover who you are exactly and what you're meant to do with your life. And what a great way to start the new year, right? So if you sign up with the code HOLIDAYS100, you'll get $100 off of your ADHD brain is a okay until the program is full. If you're interested in giving yourself a gift over the holidays, you can find more information at tracyoutsuka.com forward slash a okay. And don't forget to use the code HOLIDAYS100. I'd love to have you join us. So now let's get on to our podcast. My purpose is always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it. And in the thousands of ADHD women that I've had the privilege of meeting, I've never met a one that wasn't truly brilliant at something, not one. So of course, I am just delighted to introduce you to Marnie Boatmer. Marnie is a fitness coach who has her bachelor's in exercise science and master's in public health. She has been treated for ADHD since December of 2021. Marnie was also diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 2018, which really challenged her ideology around the fitness industry and the ridiculous belief that we aren't good enough, we aren't small enough, we need to eat less, do more, et cetera, et cetera. 
Marnie believes in taking back your power by listening to your own body and what kind of movement you need, and then moving your body to become stronger. She lives with her dog, Yoshi, and her wife, Kaylin, in Nebraska. Kaylin, if you'll recall, is our ADHD pharmacist who was also on the podcast. Marnie is also a big fan of pizza. Marnie, <laughs> you pizza? It's the best. Oh my God, I love it. You can do anything with pizza. <laughs> Well, uh, and I love that a fitness coach loves pizza that much. Absolutely. Yeah. I actually am gluten-free and that was super hard for me initially because I was like, I love chewy pizza crust, but I've made it work. I found some good gluten-free pizza crust, so we're good. What about cornmeal crust? I think that's like one of my favorites. I don't know if I've ever tried that, but a lot of the cauliflower crust pizzas are really good. So as long as you have like really good toppings on there, then I think you can't go wrong. I would agree. (laughs) <laughs> only because I don't mind the cauliflower crust at all. And I love cornmeal. Yeah. Um, anyway, before we talk about fitness, can we talk about your ADHD diagnoses first? Absolutely. So tell us what happened. What were the circumstances? Yeah, I was a couple years ago, just like in therapy, being treated for anxiety, as most of us probably are at some point in life. Yes. Um, and I'm a personal trainer, obviously. Um, and I there's just like a period where I was like training my clients and I just like could not stop overthinking life, but like especially random things. Like I would be like, okay, this is like one of my big ones. I'd be like, okay, do we have enough vegetables for the week? But it would be like obsessive where I was like, okay, yeah, I think Monday we have broccoli. I think Tuesday we have Brussels sprouts. Wednesday, you know, my and like my clients are like telling me about like their fitness goals or whatever. And I'm like, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. And then I'm like, it's just still thinking about all these other things, still doing a good job training them. Um, I would like check, like we have enough vegetables, but then I like still would be thinking about it, you know, or still like all these things. And so I was like, maybe I have OCD. Like I went and talked to my psychiatrist about it. And as I was talking to her about that, and then just like, a lot of the other, you know, she's kind of questioning me about other ways that I think what my brain is like, etc. She was like, Have you ever thought that maybe you have ADHD? And when she did that, it was only comical to me because Kayla and my wife had just been diagnosed a few months prior. So I was like, of course, of course, that's what it is. But yeah, I think it was just like, yeah, my brain all of a sudden, like with this anxiety, right, like the world of COVID, like trying to figure all these things out, my brain was just like, wait, there's so many things going on right now that I'm gonna forget something. And yeah, so that's kind of how that started for me. So it's interesting because I really believe that like attracts like. And what I've seen is that a lot of couples, their partner, you know, they're attracted to that ADHD brain. So you either do the absolute opposite, right? Right. Super linear, uh, super neurotypical, which is basically what I did, or you gravitate towards, you know, who you are. So it doesn't surprise me at all. And I see it a lot. But my question is, so... You saw Kaylin go through this whole, you know, ADHD diagnoses Mm -hmm. and you never saw yourself in it. I think I did. And she would actually say it to me a lot. You know, she would always be like, I think that you have ADHD. And like there would be, I think there was just like so much stereotype, you know, of like what ADHD is. And so I was like, maybe, but like, I would like, you know, look at like the lists of things that people have or whatever. And I was like, I mean, yeah, I was kind of a crazy kid, but like, does that count? Or I always feel like that's me in a lot of things though, like not feeling like what I have is almost like enough, you know, I guess it's kind of like an imposter syndrome thing where it's like, maybe I, maybe I don't have ADHD, you know, or whatever. So I feel like it was kind of there um, in the back of my brain. But then once I was like actually kind of presented with it, then I was like, oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. (laughs) So once you knew it was ADHD and you had the benefit of all this hindsight, what are the, some of the symptoms that maybe you had as a child a teenager, a young adult that you always wondered about, but now you recognize them as clearly ADHD. I think honestly, one of them is like that I am just like this huge social chameleon. So I was friends with people like in all the groups, like I was an orchestra, so I had like music and theater friends. I had like athletic friends. I I don't know, had people that were just like in advanced classes, et cetera. Um, but I was like in all the groups, but I didn't actually always feel like there was like one that I really jived with necessarily. So I think, I don't know, maybe there's like some, a lot of masking with that. So are you saying that you could be with these people, they all liked you, but you never really felt like you fit into any of those groups? Yes. Like those were your people. 1000%. Yeah. And I think in some ways like that can be kind of a superpower for me too, you know, cause it's like, I can kind of get along with anybody. But yeah, it's, you know, I mean, it's a weird feeling. I would imagine that, I don't know, maybe you can agree, or I don't know if you feel that way at all. But 
yeah, the sense of like, I can be like you or like, I'm excited by a lot of different things. So if somebody's like, I don't know, like, oh, I'm into caterpillars, you know, I'm like, oh my God, tell me about it. Like, I want to be into caterpillars too. Like, that's so exciting. So yeah. Well, it's that interest, right? We are interested in so many things. And Mm -hmm. so I think that's what actually makes us engaging. And honestly, Marnie, it's why social situations can be so frustrating to me because one of the things my husband and I, we actually both agree with this. I cannot stand to go into social situations where people don't talk about important things. And so they will literally just talk about themselves and have no concept that, well, maybe she's into something I might be interested in or they know what you're doing. Like they just don't ask, like people aren't interested in other people. That is so true. Yeah. And I'm like constantly like, like I definitely have had some issues with like some boundary crossing on my own end because I'm like so intrigued by people. (laughs) Oh my God, tell me everything about your life. And I'm like, oh wait, maybe I shouldn't ask you. (laughs) I feel them like sort of backing up against the wall. Like there's this big wind coming, right? Yes. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. It can be, it can be a problem for sure. (laughs) Now, What about school? Were there any issues with school or were you a good student? No problems there. I really was like, I mean, I guess good. Like, how do we define good? But like, I did well in school, um, like grade wise, intellectually, but I definitely have a lot of like impulsivity. And I think that was one of those things again, where I was like, I just think I I thought a lot of it was kind of like a quirk in some ways. But then again, with like the ADHD kind of diagnosis, looking back at it, I'm like, "Mm, yeah, I think that's what that was. I would always do things, especially in school, just because like I thought they were funny, um, even if it was like to other people's expenses. So like, this is a really random example. But when I was in high school, I remember I had to give a speech in English class. And like, right before I went up to do it, I was like, what if I just gave this whole speech like in an operatic voice? And so like, I did. And like, I just think like little random things like that were like, I don't know, like, I would like hide people's things or like, I would just do these things that were really random and like, sometimes could get me in trouble, but they weren't like so bad. Just, I don't know, I think it was like this dopamine thing where it was like, hey, this is going to make this a little bit more exciting. Yeah. (laughs) Marty, one time we were at a fraternity party. And this was, I think, my freshman year of college. And I was with a bunch of girlfriends. And I saw, like, all the the switches. Uh Like, the it it was all the switches, but it was the main switch for all the lights in the whole house. Uh And I had no idea what came over me. I probably had a beer or two, right? (laughs) Yeah. And I literally turned off all of the electricity. So the music went off. Nobody <laughs> and I remember my roommate looking at me and going, are you insane? You're like, but what? it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's 1000% something I would so do. I can yes. totally relate. So I'm curious, you did the operatic speech and how did that go over? Like, what did the teacher think? I feel it wasn't, like it wasn't as, it wasn't as long, I'm assuming. Yeah, you know, I don't, uh, to be honest, I almost like don't even really remember. Like, I feel like maybe within this class, I feel like too, it was like, okay, this would be a thing that you're doing right now. So I feel like he just, I don't know, just was like, shook his head. Like, this is like expected of you. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. <laughs> because, well, it couldn't have been bad because if it was bad, I think you'd remember it to this day. Well, 100%. That is very true. There's been like some good trauma right there. Yeah, no. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And so what about college? Any problems adjusting that first year or did you pick the right major? You went right in, no problems. I, you know, I, I kind of went in, I guess like major wise, I stuck to my major, but I went in with like the hopes and dreams of majoring in like seven things. (laughs) So I think that, uh, that is something like, I always want to do all the things. Like I definitely have that, like, I really struggle with being present with like, you know, fully being in something like, I feel like I just always have this inner sense to like move on to something new. So I chose exercise science, but like the whole time I was like, well, wouldn't it be so cool though if I actually like majored in international affairs, like just something that I know nothing about, you know, or whatever. So I think that, you know, is an aspect for sure. I was on the rowing team for a couple of years. That's actually how Kaylin and I met. And I think that was good for me, but like, just, I don't know. You know, I think like, I think physical activity, obviously I'm coming from this fitness perspective, but it's actually really great for the neurodivergent brain. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. But I I don't know. I feel like that was helpful. Um, But yeah, everything's kind of new going into that. I ended up obviously sticking with my major and I'm glad that I did. But yeah. So what has changed since you were diagnosed? I think that it's really just the awareness of like 
oh, like this is why I feel or like think the way that I do. You know, I think that it helps me just a ton to be able to actually like work with my brain, especially I think around like assessing shame that I think there's so much shame, right? And like the way that we act or view the world. So like, I feel like, again, it's like, I, maybe I don't enjoy sticking with one thing. It's like, okay, I want to switch over to this or whatever, but like being like, yeah, it's cool. That's just how my brain is now. Instead of being like, why can't I do this? You know, I mean, of course I'm not perfect. I still have those moments also, but I feel like it just puts like kind of that whole new lens on it. So do you think that your anxiety has been reduced since you've been diagnosed? I think so. I also take Vyvanse, which I do feel like helps with that. I think that like my brain likes to look for this like dopamine and sometimes it goes to being anxious about all the things. And I think a part of that too, for me sometimes is like the, um, like, what am I missing? Like I'm forgetting something probably, you know? And so it's constantly this like checklist of like, okay, like my brain, like if, you know, like while I'm like watching TV, I'm making this list of like, oh yeah, well, I probably need to go to the store or I probably left this on upstairs or, you know, but so I do think that having that awareness. But like I said, I do actually think that the Vyvanse is helpful for me, at least I know everybody has completely different experiences with that. But to at least kind of reduce some of that, it's definitely still there. But I feel like it's easier for me to like see it and be aware of it. And like, oh, hey, I see you. You're not going to control me today. (laughs) (laughs) So do you take Vyvanse every day? I yeah, most days, like almost most days. You're so lucky that it works. I'm always envious because one time, Ritalin worked for me for, you know, a couple hours. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is what it feels like to have a fully functioning brain. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's the working memory. That just blew me away that all of a sudden I could think like a linear human and just having that experience, just that one time for a couple hours. I'm so grateful for it. Yeah. Even though I now know what I'm missing, right? Yeah. It doesn't work for you anymore at all. worked one time. All oh. the other medications just created anxiety. Yeah. But at Ritalin, I was preparing for a speech that I could not memorize to save my life. And I was in the car because I popped it in my mouth right when I was getting into the car. <laughs> and I went, I drove home. It was like an hour drive. And I literally went through that speech five or six times and I did not miss a beat. Oh, that's and awesome. I, I was right back to where I was before. So <laughs> Well, hey, at least you took it at a good time. So it worked well for you in that moment. Well, not really, because the speech was like a couple of weeks later. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> shoot. <laughs> but no, I'm so grateful because now I know what people experience when they take medication and it's like, it's it works. It's like, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So I, because otherwise I probably would have been, well, you know, I'm fine without medication. So why do people need it? You totally, know, totally, totally. To, you know, it's, it's whatever our experience is that kind of leads our, our worldview, which is not good. No, I agree. So just so our listeners know, mm-hmm. Marnie and I initially started talking because I told her that I often get pushback from ADHD women around exercise. And I had been speaking with a client about working out and she said to me, well, what can real people do? And I'm thinking, I don't know, move your body in the way that works for you. Mm -hmm. And so I had shared that with Marnie and Marnie had said, you know, well, do you remember what you said to me? Oh my gosh. I just like doing something, right? Like if you just, yeah, move your body at all, then it's insanely helpful to get you going. Yeah. And, you know, you commented that even the concept of what can real people do is the whole problem, right? Because it's been so normalized in our culture that, to move your body is extreme and unattainable. And I was just, oh my gosh, that is so true. And so what happened is I just stopped using the word exercise. Mm -hmm. I now use movement with clients and my students and just in general. Yeah. I mean, here we're going to go back and forth because sure. Just what we're talking about and some of the studies and all that kind of stuff. But you know, the other thing that you said is we're so overworked Mm-hmm. We don't take care of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And so, and we've, we've made taking care of, our, of ourselves some sort of luxury that we can't possibly have time to do. But ultimately, that is exactly what we need to do to keep ourselves sane and to feel good. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And so, can you talk a little bit about fitness and how it actually does reduce ADHD symptoms, you know, if, especially if meds don't work for you, but even if they do work for you, right. Moving our body 
you know, it increases neurotransmitters and happy hormones like dopamine and norepinephrine yeah. and, yeah. you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, what is ADHD caused by? Well, research indicates. Yeah, lack of dopamine. You no, know, Yeah, lack of dopamine. So yeah. study after study just shows us. You know what? I'm going to keep stalking. Stop. <laughs> you, I, you know what? Keep talking too. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I mean, honestly, yeah, like you hit that so hard. Like it's, there have been so many studies, like you said, that talk about just the benefit of it's, I mean, obviously all the health, like there's benefits with physical activity and all the things, but especially with brain health. Um, and it has been shown that any exercise, any activity can count for that. So like, if you obviously want to like go into a CrossFit class, awesome, but also you just like walking your dog outside counts as also increasing dopamine. And then it also increases like neuroplasticity, which is like, I don't know, basically your, your brain's like ability to kind of change, um, like how your neurons actually like grow and reorganize. So that helps a ton, like with our brains, with ADHD, but even things like as we get older, like memory and, you know, cognition. Yeah. And I, you know, I think that increasing, like, I am always say like, I am really actually into like increasing, especially like strength and mobility, like no knocking on any cardiovascular movement at all. That's super important. But I just think that like, when people focus on getting stronger, I feel like the, um, the mindset with that is so huge, like, especially with people with ADHD. I think that sometimes, at least for me, like, my interoception is not always awesome. So like, if somebody's like, Hey, like, how do you feel? Tell us what interoception is. Interoception, right? So like the ability to kind of like assess like how your body feels, right? Like, so, um, do you feel like, or like, if you like close your eyes, like, can you feel how your body feels like emotionally or like, are you hungry or what's your body telling you? And I know, like, I think a lot of people with ADHD, you know, struggle with that, especially, um, I think we're just kind of taught to, right? Like we don't necessarily fit into the world normally. So we kind of stop listening to our intuition a little bit. And I think that, you know, so if somebody were to ask you something like, hey, like, do you feel like you're getting stronger or do you feel like you're getting better or more fit? That's a really hard thing to answer. Like, I think at least especially for me, I think a lot of my clients that I've had are like, I don't know. But if we say something like, hey, yesterday, you know, you could bench press 30 pounds and a month later, you or like, I guess that would be sense for it was yesterday. But, you know, whatever. A month later, uh, now you can bench press 35 pounds. Like, it's such a concrete way to be like, oh, my gosh, I improved. And I think just like what that starts to do for your, like your self-confidence and for just kind of how I always feel like how you show up in the world is massive. You know, that's really interesting. And I think it's so true for the ADHD brain. I know when I talk about tapping and I've, I've kind of applied it to everything I can, mm -hmm. they have something called a SUD score. And I cannot remember what, what, you know, the acronym stands for, but basically before you tap, you get into your body and you ask yourself scale of zero through 10. How do I feel? Yeah. And so let's say you start at an, you know, I'm anxious. Yeah. And so you start at an eight. And so you do a couple of rounds of tapping and you, then you go back and say, okay, what's my said score now? So that you're constantly evaluating where you are. And I think with the ADHD brain, we can't do that. Right. So even when we're taking medication, right? If we're not tracking it and making an F, you know, taking the effort and time to track it, we won't remember. Did we feel better before? No. Nope. <laughs> like we don't remember, right? No, nope. right. 100%. So yeah. I love that you've applied fitness. And, you know, what I'm always thinking about is cardiovascular stuff, just because we know that it, that permanently improves physical, mental, and psychological health. But you're mm -hmm. right about the strength because that is a way to automatically be able to track is, is what you're doing making you stronger. Exactly. Yeah. And I think too, you know, it just applies, like, I guess to me, I always think so in that exact same example, right. Of like, um, I could bench press 30 pounds and then I could bench press 35 pounds. So I feel like I always say like at the end of the day, like in real world, like that does not matter, you know, like it's not gonna, like, it just doesn't matter. But I think again, what that can do for your confidence and like, like I said, how you just kind of show up then, like I've seen people who are like, Oh yeah, well, okay. I was, I did this and I got better at it. So now when I go out into the actual real world, um, maybe I feel like I have a little more confidence to speak up for myself within, you know, a certain scenario or, um, yeah, I just, I think there's like so many other things that it like really translates into, um, which I love, like, it makes me excited. You know, like I have somebody that like was able to do a box jump when they couldn't before. And I'm like, yes, like, it's so exciting to actually like see your body do something that you didn't think you could do before that helps us mentally in so many ways. You know, the other thing that I just want to 
I want to say, because medication doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. So when I tried medication, I felt completely unbalanced on medication. It literally made me so anxious. And then I'd be taking other medications to combat the <laughs> right. anxiety. Like the whole thing is just not yeah. working. No. Exercise, however, increases and balances all of these neurotransmitters like dopamine perfectly. Yes. So you get all of the benefits right. without any of the negative side effects if you struggle with medication, you know, side effects from medication. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now that we've made the case for movement, so we know, right, that the studies show, tell me if I'm wrong or if there's anything you can add, that exercise, it sharpens our focus, it improves our mood, concentration, and motivation, and it also helps us to learn. We're not smarter because of it, but we are primed to learn after we exercise. My, my favorite book is on, on exercise in the brain is, it's an older book, but it's written by Dr. John Rady, who wrote Driven to Distraction and ADHD 2.0 with Ned Hallowell. Okay. And he has ADHD and the book is called Spark. Okay. No, I've never read it. Um, I love that book. So anyway, okay. So we know, so if people want to know more about, you know, what exercise can actually do for the brain, you know, beyond what I just said and reducing yeah. anxiety, go read Spark. All right. By, yeah. By Dr. John Rady. So now we know that exercise is great for the ADHD brain. We have studies that show that. Now, yeah. what I'd like to know is, and I, the reason why I thought you'd be such a great guest to talk about fitness is because you really seem to understand how the ADHD brain works, right? We don't like to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. We need for it to be kept simple. It needs to be like no big deal. It needs to be fun. So let's say that someone's listening who mm -hmm. wants to be more successful with movement. And honestly, they just have this really negative, you know, reaction whenever anybody talks about exercise. Mm -hmm. Where would be a good place to start? Like, you know, the kind of person who says to me, <laughs> what can real people do? Right, right. Yeah. I think, I mean, like, this is like so simple to be like, we need to just get rid of that stigma, but that's the truth first off. But yeah, it's like, I mean, moving your body like is meant for everybody, right? Like it's not like meant for elite people. And so I think that, you know, especially like, I don't know, we watch TV and you just see people who are competing in things. And so many people are like, I like, and I have this too, where you're almost like, I have to be perfect at something before I even want to start it. Right. Like that's me. Like I used to be like, Oh, like I want to play the guitar, but like, I don't want to have to learn chords. That's terrible. So then I'm like, I can't play the guitar, you know, which is like, doesn't make any sense. But I think a lot of people approach exercise that way too, where it's like, I would meet with clients who will tell me things like, okay, right now I'm not working out at all. Okay, great. And I'll say, what are your goals for December? And they'll say, okay, my goal in December is to work out seven days a week and to work out for an hour every time. And I'm like, okay, right now you're not doing anything. So maybe we start out smaller. Like what if we start with 20 minutes, you know, three times a week. And so I think that that's a huge component is like, you can start with something, but it does not have to be this like huge, big thing in your brain. Like, it's just like, let's find something. And I think the second thing is like, really, like, it sounds kind of cheesy almost, but like really thinking about like what you want to do or what you like to do movement wise, you know, I personally hate running. And like, I used to run because I wanted to do like these half marathons, especially in Walt Disney World and get their awesome medals. Um, but like, I actually don't love running. And I every time I went to go like train for it, I dreaded it. And I was like, I don't want to go do this anymore. But I think there's like, this kind of sometimes like social, I guess, expectation or thought process that doing especially a lot of like cardio and things like that, again, not knocking it, but like that that's just kind of like what you should do. And if you love that, and you get a runner's high, go for it. But if you don't, it's like what you know, maybe you like doing yoga, like maybe you want to maybe you want to dance, like, maybe you want to try to lift up some, you know, something heavy or whatever. So I think, you know, kind of actually thinking about what that looks like. And there's not a one size fits all there's not necessarily just something that you have to do. But it's like just finding something that works for your body and working for your brain is going to be, you know, your most successful and thing to get you going. I, I totally hear you on the running. The joke around here is the only way you're going to get me to run is if you chase me with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so as you're talking, I'm thinking that, you know, when I work with my ADHD students and clients, we have something called a Datex cube and mine looks like bamboo. I'm not sure if it really is bamboo. And there's times on each side. There's mm -hmm. 25 minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And 
The beauty of it is I get out of my head when I'm struggling to start and I just turn it on its end, Mm -hmm. you know, on 25 minutes. But I strike this deal with myself that all you have to do is 25 minutes. If you want to stop after that, you can stop. And so that kind of made me think about if someone is struggling so much with starting, can they literally start with, I'm going to go outside and I'm just going to walk around for 10 minutes. And that's all I have to do. Yep. And, and, you know, it's one of those things too, like if you haven't been doing anything like 10 minutes, that's awesome. I think too, you know, sometimes like, I feel like a lot of us, right, who are neurodivergent have some sort of like hyper focus or interest, but like, how can you make that a part of your movement? Like my wife and I, like we, I mean, so we have a, we kind of built in our basement to be a gym, but we love to like, um, play certain music. So like we'll theme it. Like, so like during Halloween, you know, we would play like Halloween type music or just like trying to make it more exciting to go down there. Like, Ooh, yeah. Like I'm going to, I'm going to do this, you know, so it can be anything. Like maybe you're really into a certain movie. You can play the soundtrack. Like you can pretend you're a superhero, you know, like, it's just, I feel like finding some way to like connect it to something that you're already into instead of like having this mental attachment of like, this is something that I already hate. And I go into it, you know, like I say to my clients all the time, like if you, if you're mental space is like, this sucks. And it's going to be hard. And it's going to be terrible. But I just have to do it like, it's going to suck. And it's going to be terrible. And you're going to hate it, you know, but if you can try to find something that like, like, maybe you already enjoy and throw that into it, that can be huge. You know, the other thing and you had alluded to it is neuroplasticity. And I mean, I am the perfect example of this. I decided, you know, I'd never worked out first thing in the morning. I mean, Mm -hmm. I just, you know, I, I, I wasn't doing it. And I would work out kind of later in the evening, usually after work. But I realized that, okay, if medication isn't going to work for me, yeah. we know that a course of, sorry, but again, we're talking about, you know, aerobic exercise. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What is it? 25 minutes, I think of 70% max heart rate. Yeah. It's as good as a course of um, Ritalin. Uh-huh. Actually, I think it's Ritalin and Adderall. Okay. It's both of them. So it really does jack up the dopamine. And so I decided this is what I was going to do, but it was really hard initially. Mm -hmm. But what I found is over time, your brain literally changes. So maybe I didn't make it every single time because I I work out Monday through Friday. Honestly, it's now gotten to the point where I work out specifically for my brain. Yeah, I love that. Um, Because I can't even start writing or doing anything until, you know, I... The dopamine's, you know, right. Go in. Yeah. Yeah. I did that and it was really hard initially. And so maybe it was, you know, that I only did 15 minutes and then I did, you know, the other part in the evening and I I kept moving it around, but I'm telling you over time, I don't even think about it anymore because my brain has changed. Mm -hmm. So now when I wake up, it's like a robot. It's the weirdest thing. I get up, I put my stuff on and I go right upstairs. Yeah. Just what you do. You know, I think- I've made it, but I've made it so easy. Like if I had to go to a gym, I would never do it. Yeah. So I think that I can't remember why I started to, to oh, I, it was more just, um, hold on one second. I just dropped my pen. It was more just, you know, if you feel like it's really hard initially, know that over time your body will literally crave it. Yeah. And I think it's the circadian rhythm, right? Our circadian clock. It just, it starts to adjust, which is this clock that we all have inside ourselves that is regulated by when we get up in the morning and then when we go to bed at night. Mm -hmm. But exercise also helps with the circadian clock to get you on a regular rhythm. And so I wake up in the morning and it's honest to God, I feel like a robot. I just go up there. It's never a thought. Am I going to do this or am I not going to do this? And let me tell you, especially when it's cold in the morning, it used to be a thought all the time. So our brain literally changed. You said something else, which I thought was really good. You talked about a challenge, like how can you make it a challenge? Because we love those. And I can't remember, what were you talking about, Marnie? Oh my goodness. I don't remember what I was talking about, (laughs) but I could come up with a good uh, thing with that. Like you said, like I think that with the ADHD brain, it's like, we don't want to do something that's boring or monotonous. A lot of us like different puzzles even. And a lot of times it's like for myself, like it doesn't work for my life to work out in the morning just because I usually train people really early. So I, my first you know client starts at six 30 in the morning. I also train people in the evening. So I'm doing it in the afternoon. And so benefits from just sitting there and watching them. 
training? <laughs> surely, surely there's like some oh, sort some of like benefits. Yeah. Something's going through the air and like, yeah, it's like a transfer. <laughs> but yeah, so I work out in the afternoon and sometimes, yeah, for sure. Like I am, I am not always motivated by any means to go, you know, do movement. But I think that um, sometimes, so for me, like, I guess like even thinking about like a challenge of like, Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to switch up like my modalities today. So like, if I've been doing dumbbells, like maybe I'm going to go try to do kettlebells or, you know, finding like a different way to like switch that up can be, I think, really helpful. But I think also, yeah, just having like maybe setting little goals for yourself too. And it does not have to be huge. Like we're not, you know, fit. I would say fitness isn't linear. Like you're not going to do something and then every day get better and better and better. Like that just doesn't make sense. But even if it's saying, Hey, within, you know, three months, I want to be able to do a pull up or, you know, just like kind of starting to like make these little goals that make it more exciting instead of the goal. I think again, for me, that's why I like strength, because I think that especially as women, I think, you know, we're just always taught to be less, right. To be smaller, to lose weight, or to even maintain your weight that you're at so that you don't get bigger. So I think like that's really unmotivating for a lot of us. And it's, already there. It's ever present. And so I think when you can kind of change that mind to think like, how can I challenge my body physically? Like, what can my body do? I think that that is like a great way sometimes to get yourself moving into a new, you know, a new scenario. Like I said, I was diagnosed with MS. And I think that that was a really big aspect of that for me where I was like, okay, so I have this now other disease where it in theory, you know, could get rid of my ability to move my body in the way that I currently am, which I had to go through my own grieving process with that. But I think a lot of it ended up then being like, okay, well, what can I do right now? You know, like, what can my body do right now? And like, that feels exciting. So instead of constantly thinking like, I need to be burning this many calories, or I need to do 30 minutes just because, you know, the American Heart Association told me I need to or whatever. But instead of trying to find that kind of challenge within that, I feel like that is empowering. You know, Marnie, um, I just wanted to share something with you about multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. I am wondering, have you read the book by Gabor Mate, The Myth of Normal? I have not. Oh, my gosh. I highly recommend that you read it. There's a section in here. I think it's a, a Turkish doctor, female doctor who was diagnosed with MS at, I think she was 25. And he goes into this discussion with other medical experts um, and this woman and talks about MS and how the number of women that are being diagnosed with MS, other autoimmune diseases, other inflammatory diseases, it's just off the charts. Yeah. And what they did is they went and they looked at the childhood and the lives of these kids, um, of, of these of these women when they were kids, and that there was trauma but also this need to please. So what these doctors were saying is that their patients were all like the kindest, most helpful, most considerate, always worrying about everybody else before they worried about themselves. And I'm just curious if that rings true to you at all. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I think that, you know, I was raised in the Midwest, I was raised in the church, which has its own, you know, set of expectations and assumptions of how you should be. Especially for girls. And oh, I think, yeah. gosh, especially for women. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, and I think, yeah, perception was quite large in my family growing up and just, you know, kind of looking like we always have our shit together. Um, and so yeah, 100%. I think there's yeah, a lot of it's one of those things too. like, I remember actually, when I was like, in seventh grade that there was a kid that told me he and this is so it's funny to me but he was like you're wearing a mask and I was like what like what is that I didn't even know what that means you know and he was like yeah like there's no way that you're actually like as happy as you are all the time and I like literally did not understand that at all um which is really funny to me that the kids told me that when we were like 13 yeah but now that I'm older I'm like okay yeah you know like I just I didn't even I think there's so like we're talking about interoception right like I feel like there's so much um like I'm literally working on that in therapy still where it's like accessing my emotions, like accessing like how I actually feel about something that's not easy for me. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's an aspect of that. Right. Cause you're almost taught in some ways. And I think being neurodivergent also like where like you put your needs aside and you just take care of other people or, you know, you kind of, yeah, like manage the scenario to make everybody else happy. It's just fascinating. And I don't know if you heard the episode of the podcast that we did a couple of weeks ago with Amanda Smith, who was also diagnosed with MS. Mm -hmm. And I shared this book with her recently. And she was like, Tracy, yeah, I, I, I totally like, you know, she raised her hand. Mm -hmm. And 
how when our nervous systems are constantly dysregulated, you know, we're trying to be that good girl, we're trying to fit in, we're trying to please everybody and not yep. thinking about ourselves, that a lot of these diseases are what results. Yeah, I think no, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, yeah, obviously, everybody has their thoughts on, you know, all of these different triggers. And I'm sure, you know, of course, there's like environmental and all these things too. But yeah, I think that stress is so, so huge. And especially when we don't, you know, I think it's like, you don't always realize that you're stressed, you know, on the surface level. I think that I guess, I guess that was me where it was like, yeah, I'm fine. Everything's good. But then when you start to become in tune with like, what is going on inside of your head and yeah. how you're navigating you're the world. all the time, right? You don't even know what stress means anymore. Exactly. Yeah. It's just like part of our culture, which is sad. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think Gabor Mateo's um, take on it. And I, you know, I was, people would talk about him all the time. And I was like, no, because, you know, he believes that ADHD is all the result of trauma. Okay, yeah. And I would think, no, I don't have trauma. What are you talking about? Right, right. And then what he would say is, but what about your parents? Yeah. Intergenerational trauma. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You have a parent who was, you know, raised through the through a war and you know, and, yeah. and then it starts to make sense because his belief is that, you know, for example, maybe something like MS, where you have the the genes for it, but the question is, are those genes going to be expressed or not? Exactly. Yep, exactly. It's so, it's so fascinating. Okay, so I want to ask you, I am a huge proponent of, you know, the Apple Watch or just fitness watches, because, again, you know, we we tend to not be aware of a lot, right? We're just kind of going through life. And so when anything brings me awareness, like I, I recently started wearing an aura ring, mm -hmm. and I love it because now I am it literally will tell me, you know, oh, you haven't, I'm not sure if this is the Apple Watch or the yeah, Aura, yeah. but you know, they'll tell you, oh, you haven't gotten up in two hours or four hours. Yeah. You know? And it'll also track how is my sleep, mm -hmm. how is my heart rate, like all of these things. And how do they relate when I'm working out versus when I'm not working out, when I'm eating later versus when I'm not eating later? Like, you know, all of these things that I had never I never realized how they're all interrelated. Yeah. But I know some people are like, no, I, you know, I don't like those kinds of tracking devices. Yeah. So, and I'm trying to remember why I recently read someone who said they didn't like them and they didn't like them because, for example, with the aura ring, they would, you know, get a notification that whatever is down. And so you're probably not going to have as productive of a day. And so you should rest. Oh, uh, right? yeah, yeah. And so then they would be like, ah, screw it. You yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of course, I don't really listen to that. I just keep going, but I <laughs> right. like, power through. Yeah. <laughs> right. But I like going back and knowing that, oh, well, that's why I was especially tired. You know, all my stats are down. So I'm just curious. Yeah. Do you find that those sorts of ways to measure are helpful? Or I think. Clients or what? Yeah, I honestly think it so depends on you as a human and how you're motivated. So I've seen it be really effective for some people, especially just like you said, like little goals, little challenges, which I think a lot of times, again, with, you know, ADHD, a lot of us enjoy. So it's like, oh, you know, somebody's trying to get 10,000 steps, you realize you're at 9,000. I've had people be like, oh, yeah, so I just took my dog for an extra walk, you know, to get that. And it was great. So I think, you know, I think that that can be helpful. I do that all the time. <laughs> yes. Uh, a couple of downsides though. Like one, you know, we're kind of talking about like that interoception, like that kind of gets rid of a lot of that where if you're like, oh, my watch tells me that I didn't sleep well. It's like, well, did you sleep well? You know, like, do you feel rested? Like, I think that it can sometimes help almost like encourage us to not listen to our bodies when we're just looking at, you know, a piece of equipment. But same, I think that kind of goes that way with um, like, and this isn't an Apple watch, but you can track, you know, like your food, you can log your macronutrients, which is an insanely, insanely helpful way. Like if your goal is to lose weight or, you know, to put on muscle, et cetera, but it can have so many like negative side effects too, right? Where like you just, I mean, I had that, like I used to like log my food back, you know, in the day and um, yeah, like I did lose body fat, but then all of a sudden it becomes like this mind game where sometimes I'd be like, oh, well, I can only have 20 more carbs today or whatever. And it just like, I think fuels and just, it can fuel into obsession and I think same with like the, and worse, right? Yes. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've had clients say that too, like, Hey, this was supposed to be kind of my rest day. And now my watch is telling me I didn't meet my goal. So then I feel bad about myself. And so, you know, I think that they can be really helpful tools, maybe especially even at like the beginning of when you start doing something, you know, where you're like, okay, let me just see what I actually am doing. So you can kind of compare like, 
what that looks like. But then I think, yeah, you kind of have to assess like, what is this doing for you? Is it good for you? Like, do you feel excited when you look at it? You know, do you feel like it's, you know, or would you look at it and you're just feeling a bunch of shame? Because that's not helpful. So yeah, I really think it, it really depends, I think, on who you are. And you know what? That is such a great comment. And it's what I always talk about. So it makes perfect sense. You know your body. You know how you feel. It's that rudder inside you, right? And mm-hmm. so if you're feeling positive emotion, keep doing it. If it's feeling like a lot of negative emotion, get rid of it. Totally. Yeah. I think too, I, I feel like people have had that like where they want to weigh themselves. They're like, oh my gosh, like I'm feeling so great. And then they weigh themselves and it's not a number they want to see. And then they're like, oh, I don't feel great anymore. You know, like the power of that mind is is insane. <laughs> yeah, totally. You know, the other thing that I was just thinking of, again, and I think it's interoception, I think it's exactly what you're saying, is that we're just kind of always on to the next thing and we're not in our body, we're in our head. Versus after you work out, to me, this is a big key, is you have to pay attention to how you feel after you moved, right? Yeah. Because you have to connect that, oh, I feel really good afterwards because that's what makes you then do it when you don't want to start. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. When I used to like, you know, I would like try to work out in between clients. So I'd have like a client, you know, at seven in the morning and nine in the morning. So I'm like quickly working out. And then I'm like, okay, great. I got to go train my next client. And so I'm like going over and I'm like shaking, you know, like writing their workout or whatever for the next person. And then it was like, what are you doing? Like, I'm literally just like checking something off a box where I'm like running around from thing to thing, which was my probably insane ADHD brain in that moment. But yeah, like, I mean, I feel like there is so much benefit because then I wasn't looking forward to it. You know, it's like, I feel like crap, like I'm like trying to get this in and I feel terrible, like going into my next person. But like you said, I think afterwards, if you can actually like, that's something I should have been working on a lot. Cause again, I'm, I'm not great at being present. So I've been trying to work on like, okay, I'm going to intentionally stretch, but while I stretch, I'm going to try to like do a couple of deep breaths right here and pay attention to my breathing. Like it sounds a little like woo woo, I guess in a way, but I feel like it, it does help a lot. Like kind of like, let me calm and regulate my nervous system right now. Because when you work out, you know, like you do put your body into a fight or flight response. Like you're turning on that sympathetic nervous system. So we have to like intentionally take it back off, you know? So we have to be like, Hey body, like, it's great that we were there, but now I'm going to breathe. And you know, we're going to turn on our parasympathetic nervous system and get ready to go for the day. So we don't act like a bunch of psychopaths. (laughs) So can you explain that to us? Because I've always wondered, like, how is it that, okay, I wake up in the morning, my cortisol levels are highest, and I may have some of that weird dread thing going around in my brain, but I can't think of what I'm dreading. It's just a feeling, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There's nothing going on in my life. Yeah. But I work out then, and I feel so much better. And when you work out, you're also increasing your cortisol levels, right? So how, what, what the hell is going on? I think it's like that concept, right? Of like, when you work out your people kind of say sometimes that you're almost like completing a stress cycle. Like, I've heard this, um, I can't remember who it is now. There are these two women, this book just came out not that long ago about like overcoming stress. I can't remember what the book is called. But their kind of thing was like, you know, when you're like our primal people, right, we're in the savannah, and you see a lion and your cortisol, like you said, like everything, like your adrenaline's going. And then you run, you run away from the lion. And so that running actually completes your stress cycle. And so then you can feel calm afterwards. But like in our society today, we have something like you get an email from your boss and you feel this adrenaline surge, but then we just sit down and we, like, we don't do anything to kind of complete that stress cycle. So then we just go and open up another email and then we get on Facebook and then we, whatever. And so like all of that is still like chilling in your body until you actually can like physically move it out of your system. I think that's a super interesting way to think about it, but I think that it's insanely true. So even when we're moving, we're jacking up our cortisol levels, but for some reason, because we're completing the stress cycle, that's how we feel better after because we're, we must be getting rid of something. Yeah. I guess that's my understanding of that process. Huh. That's really interesting though, because it is so true. You know, we get stressed. I mean, I can't do it anymore. If something stresses me out that has to do with business, I just need to get away from it and go do something else. Even if it's just go for a walk, go in the garden, pet my dog. I cannot just sit here and continue because my brain will explode. I literally too. Like I just start going like whenever I was younger, like my dad would try and help me with math. It was like, if I was frustrated, it didn't even matter what he was saying. Like I was like, nope, nope, nope. Like (laughs) my brain is shut down. I do not know what's happening right now. Yep. I'll like space out. I'll think about something else. Cause I'm like, I just can't, like I literally just cannot right now, but I'll come back to it in a bit and I'll be okay. But yeah. Uh, 
So what are some tips for keeping your movement novel um, if you want to still stay with the same program? I mean, I I do admit that, yes, I'm kind of on autumn. What is it called? Automon? Auto? Whatever. Autopilot? Yeah. (laughs) Whatever it's called. Um, Autopilot? Is that what we're going for? I don't know. There isn't there some robot auto man? Auto- <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. I'm <laughs> anyway, gonna need to meet him. <laughs> I am definitely like that. But I gotta tell you, I'm like, oh my god, I don't want to do this. This is so boring. A yes. lot. And so I end up. I listen to podcasts. I talk on the phone sometimes. Mm-hmm. I I read like you know, and I I really feel like I'm not a music person. Mm-hmm. Okay. Unfortunately, I yeah. feel like. If I didn't have these other things, oh, I'm on Twitter. If I didn't have these other things, I probably would work out harder, but it's really the only way I can get through the workout. So screw it. And as you know, and my heart rate is way up there, so I'm okay. Um, obviously, I can't really do those things when I do weights. I, I can listen to an audiobook, but I'll tell you, I'm constantly running. So this is terrible. I listen to the audiobook, but I also have the physical book. I have highlighters, I have tags. Granted, what I'm reading is nonfiction all the time. So I'm running back, you know, I'm working out with the waves. I'm listening to the audiobook, running back to the page that's so great. I like it. <laughs> yes. Putting it down. It's not, <laughs> not as productive from a fitness perspective. It's fine. You know, it's fine. It could be better. <laughs> yeah. But everything could be better, right? Like, yeah, we're just looking to get it in, not be perfect. There's so much expectation, first off, right? That we have to just change when we go into something. Like, even you said, like, Um, Well, I'd probably be working out harder if I was like X, Y, Z, but it's almost like, what's your goal and what's your intention, which I've had to do so much of. Like, I think, especially I would say like being in the fitness industry, my expectations for myself, like went through the roof where I was like, well, people are going to expect me to be the strongest, to be the leanest, to be the whatever. And so for a while, I actually like hated working out because I had that thought where it was like, if I'm not coming in and like PRing all the time, you know, like hitting super high weights or whatever, then like, it's not good enough. And I had to like, so change that. And again, it's like, what, what are my goals? Like, and again, for me personally, like, I just, I love being strong or I love like seeing kind of what my body can do in different movements. So I think that there's a huge component to that, where if you are kind of thinking about like, why are you even doing this in the first place? Or like you said, maybe you're just coming in. Cause you're like, I just know I need to move my body then like, what does that feel like to you? It could literally, like I said, I mean, you can like have a dance party and like you're moving your body, you know, it doesn't have to be something boring and monotonous, but I do, you know, there is some benefits in following, like I said, like a program, like if you're doing a progressive, let's say like a, a strength training program, it takes time and you, it doesn't like, you're not actually going to necessarily like you'll get stronger, but if you want to actually see progress, you have to do similar movements, you know, similar times. Um, I think that switching some of it up can be really helpful. So like, let's just say for instance, that like you wanted to do a, I don't know, a back squat and you were doing three sets of 10. And then the next time you went and did three sets of 10 again, like it's going to get really boring, but maybe you start changing like, okay, today I'm going to do a front squat or today I'm going to do a one and a half back squat. So instead of going just down and up, I'm going to come down, you know, quarter up and down and back up. Like, I think there's certain ways that you can change that. Like I mentioned earlier, even like changing some of like your modalities, like, okay, maybe I'm going to do this body weight today, or I'm going to do a squat jump, or I think that can be helpful. Just like actually kind of coming in with some plans, like when your brain is like, I need something new to have something new. And then I think like you said, though, I mean, yeah, like there are definitely extra tools out there. Um, Like I, yeah, I am huge into music and I literally will change mine constantly. Like today I'm going to work out to Broadway musicals. That's fun. You know, (laughs) like uh, now I'm going to listen to all like, I don't know, reggaeton music or whatever. So like I find that to be enjoyable. We have a TV downstairs and sometimes we'll put on just like different movies even. Like I'm just going to put like, like the other day I had the Muppets Christmas Carol on in the background. Like So, you know, it's like whatever works. I think that could be helpful. Um, different lighting. Like if you're not like in a main gym, I think that can be fun too. Like if you kind of change what some of your setting is, it can be an outfit. It can be a drink. Like I know my wife, Kaylin, she loves like, she'll have like three different drinks downstairs to help her. Like she'll have water. She'll bring like a sparkling drink down. She'll bring, you know, and so she's like, it's just more exciting that I have different options. You know, so yeah, I think switching things up like that can make it way more enjoyable. Well, and that's the thing. If it helps you to work out, Mm -hmm. let's say you want to work out every morning, and if it helps to friggin' have 48 hours on, right? To get you through it, who cares? I mean, I know I know a lot of us have this thing about all these like murder shows. Yeah. I, I mean, three hours, Dateline, you know, 2020, 20, it's bad. Sometimes, literally when I'm editing work, I cannot start and I'm like, screw it, I'm just going to turn this on. 
And what I notice is it's kind of in the background. Yep. I don't really know what's going on. Nope. But it, it helps. makes it more palatable. 100% it does. Yep. I have that too. Like they put on some RuPaul's Drag Race and I'm good to go. Yep. <laughs> yes. So you're saying it doesn't matter how you do it, just so long as you do it. Yes. And at the end, you realize that you feel better for doing it. Oh, whatever yeah. Whatever doing it is. Exactly. And like, yeah, again, just like society tells us that it has to look a certain way, you know, and it, it really doesn't. Like, it's again, it's whatever works well for you. And yeah, if you want to go do parkour, go do it. You know, <laughs> go find something that makes you excited at the end of the day. That's what it is. It's finding what works for you. Like, we're neurodivergent. Like, we already don't fit into society how society says that we should. So, your workouts don't need to either. So um, I know you had mentioned um, imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. and I'm curious, do you think that you can overcome imposter syndrome using movement? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that it absolutely can be really helpful for it. I guess to me, right, imposter syndrome is like thinking that you're not good enough for something, uh, like having a lot of like self-doubt in your abilities. And so I guess it's a really kind of ties into what I was saying kind of at the beginning, where I think when you, especially if you are going into your movement, like not exactly feeling confident or knowing what you're going to do. And again, you start to see that progress, you start to feel better. And you can be like, Oh, wait, here's like something again, just so concrete that I can actually start to do. I feel like that is um, amazing. Like I think I yeah, yeah, I think that's it's just super helpful. And especially if you can kind of align your goals for it too. Yes, absolutely. Well, and it's really just I would expect that the more you're successful in your fitness goals, the more confidence you're going to have. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like you, and like you said, you know, it starts to release all of these great endorphins within your body. You feel like you can move. And I mean, I've like make this comment sometimes, but sometimes I think like I always, so I really like the concept of like functional training. So like, instead of just saying like, Hey, I'm going to sit down on this machine and I'm going to do seated leg extensions. Like that's fine. But like, when do you ever do that movement in real life? You know, you don't sit down and just kind of move your leg like that. It's great if you're a bodybuilder. But in real life, you know, I might have to like, yeah, squat down to pick something up or um, like doing like a clean type motion is something you do in real life. So sometimes I think like, okay, let's say that you're getting on an airplane and you have to take your suitcase and you know that it's super heavy because you didn't want to pay for a baggage, you know, so it's like, we got a lot in there and you, have to, <laughs> yeah. and you have to pick it up and you got to put it in the overhead bin. You know, I think that's one of those things. It's like, well, if I, I've been practicing this, like I know how to use my hips. I know how to get my shoulders up over there and press that bag overhead. I can do this on my own. Um, and so I guess to me, sometimes like that's really what a lot of my strength stuff does too. And I think I've seen that in my clients where it's like, Oh, look at these things I can do now in the real world. Like, it's not just me moving a, like a piece of metal, but it's like, I can actually like move things, you know, or like, I, I don't know, like I'm going, I'm walking to Walt Disney World with my friends and I can keep up with them and we can walk, you know, all of Epcot or, you know, whatever, I'm but like this Walt Disney theme. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> it's there. Um, yeah. yeah. That, makes, that makes so much sense because again, it's like, it's that positive emotion thing. And that you are pausing and acknowledging and being proud of, you're acknowledging what you've done. You're mm -hmm. proud of yourself. And so you're actually using the exercise or the fitness, you know, the fact that you're sticking to your fitness goals, you're using that throughout the day. Yeah. Pat yourself on the back. 100. Yeah. I have a client. She's, she's older. And I used to say something like, all right, we're going to get strong. And she would say something to me like, I don't care about getting stronger. And I remember thinking about it and, uh, you know, whatever, we would have chats about it. But she came to me one day and she was telling me that she was like at her church and she was standing on a, like a chair, like trying to like change like the votives and like the candle things. And that somebody who was also like an older human told her like, oh my gosh, look at how well you just got onto that chair. I don't think I could ever do that. And then she told me, she came back and she was like, okay, you were right. Like, you know, I felt like I was strong enough and I was stable enough to be able to do this. And I was like, yeah. So again, it's not like, oh, I could leg press a hundred pounds, but it's like, oh my God, I can move well through life. You know, like, I think that's, I don't know. I think that's like the most empowering thing ever. I think in society, it's just like this assumption that like, you're going to get older, you're going to stop being able to move your body and everything is going to be the worst, which like, you know, we age, things are going to deteriorate. Like you're not going to be the exact same, but I don't think that we have to expect like what society has told us, you know, getting older needs to look like in a lot of ways. Yes. Also. Yeah. Yes. So I have a very good friend of mine, um, Sandra Santorino. And uh, she turned 60 mm -hmm. and her knee was really a problem because she had played soccer. I think until she was in her forties. Yeah. 
And she was really struggling with her knee. And for some reason, she's very social and she got a bee in her bonnet that she was going to try pickleball. Uh-huh. <laughs> and she tried pickleball during the summer and, you know, true to form, hyper focus. She is so into pickleball and she's really good at it. Like yeah. She's meeting all these, you know, guys that are playing pickleball. Yeah. And Get it, it just cracks me up that, you know, she decided like just sitting in a gym or sitting on a Peloton, you know, that just was not going to be her thing. She liked people. She's social. And so she made this whole contingent of friends in a couple months playing pickleball and she just loves it. Like she literally looks forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. I think too. I mean, so on the side, I actually coach at Orange Theory, but I know like, I feel like there's a, you know, a big community with things like that too, where people are like, Hey, okay, we all work out at, you know, seven 30 in the morning. Yeah. When you can start to connect a social aspect, like if somebody is struggling with working out, that can be a huge component. And it's also just that accountability too, or, you know, me working with a trainer, like any of that, but having accountability can obviously be really helpful. Um, I know that you mentioned too, like, obviously we were talking about the fitness apps or fitness watches, but you can, you know, be friends with people on there too, and link up and, you know, Hey, I did my workout. Oh, so did me. You know, I think that all oh, that's really helpful. I think all it gives you like a little dopamine, right? Like, oh yeah, I'm going to do it now too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just all these little hits of dopamine that lead to positive emotion. And if it feels good, keep doing it. Absolutely. Yeah. So what are the ADHD traits that you feel are responsible for your success? I think that I guess some of the probably biggest ones um, are a I guess like we were talking about me just kind of being that like a chameleon in a way I think that um, even if sometimes I'm connecting with people like kind of surfacey, I think that it really helps me to uh, like connect with people which helps me to understand them a little bit better and help motivate them in the way that they need to be. I think that's a really big one because I think that um just lost my train of thought there, like ADHD moment of pausing. Um, <laughs> oh, it's just talking about the whole chameleon thing. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, I think also I was just thinking actually, cause like my brain is going everywhere all the time. Like it just did right now, but that it helps me actually help people identify like solutions that they need, you know, like it's like, because I, my brain is always going. So when somebody tells me like, Hey, here's an area where I really struggle. I think it's a lot easier for me to see possibilities for people like, Oh, well, what if we tried this? You know, like, like, Oh, okay. I didn't even think about that. So sometimes it's obnoxious to me that I, you know, can't stay focused on something. My brain's going all over the place, but also I think it can be so helpful in those moments, you know, when we're looking for solutions. I am incredulous, Marnie, that you never considered ADHD. Really. <laughs> oh my gosh, your level of energy and how fast you talk. I and know, I, I know. I'm like, sorry. I can tell in your brain how it's just bouncing from place to place. But I told good, myself right? to speak slowly and. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. Like, right away, when you started talking, I was like, okay, if this woman lived close to me, like I would love her. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I I know. So oh gosh. Yeah. It's all so over the place. What is your number one ADHD workaround? Do you have one? Oh man. Um, I think just changing things up. Like I, you know, I said that earlier, but like I said, I, I freaking hate monotony. And so I think that's like my biggest one. It's like, you know, there's, I think for everybody, like everything's going to look different, but I really think that's it. Like whatever you're doing, if you, you know, you're bored with it, like do something else. Or like you said, if it works for you, like don't find shame in it. As long as you're not hurting anybody else or hurting yourself, like what if it's working for you, do it, even if it's not conventional. Wonderful. So Marnie, are you working on something that you want to tell us about? I am going to be doing a talk at some point coming up in mid-January. So that's all going to be via, like you can uh, go to my website, which is my name. It's www.marniebothmer.com. Can you Um, spell it? Yes. M-A-R-N-I-E. B O T H M E R dot com. Um, and on there, you can sign up on my email list. Um, I send out emails like once or twice a month. And so I will alert you of any events that I do have. I do some kind of like Zoom events um, going over questions that I commonly get from people. And they also sign up for a breakthrough session if you're interested. If you're just like, hey, I have a lot of like really specific questions I kind of want to go through about my own fitness journey, um, we can set up a time and kind of chat about that as well. Wonderful. So this is going to be all in our show notes. So you can find it there. Marnie, thank you so much for spending time with us here today. Yes. Thank you so much. It's been super fun. Yeah. And before I leave you, just a quick reminder, the doors for our first ever January, your ADHD brain is a okay 
program are open. And if you want to save $100, use the code HOLIDAYS100. You can go to tracyoutsuka.com forward slash AOK for more information. I would love to have you join us. So that's what I have for you for this week. If you like this episode with Marnie, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Come join me over at tracyoutsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A-OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.